welcome everybody. Really have, lovely to have you here uh, to join us for our third session on the Inspire session, Demystifying Grants and Bid Writing. We are so excited to have a lovely lineup today. I'm your host, Carolyn Amelende Baguma, and I am the Senior Community Program Manager for The World Reimagine. This session today is brought to you by our funders, Esme Fairburn Foundation, and our presenting partner, Sky. Thanks to them, we are able to create a space to connect, share knowledge with our communities nationwide. So I'm so excited. Um, you can enable transcriptions if you want, but joining us today, we have Ruth um, Ebeguna, and I apologize if I say that wrong. I always feel a little bit that I say that wrong, but that's the founder of Rekindle School and the trustee at the World Reimagine. We also have Helen Cooper, who's a senior philanthropy manager slash visual arts manager at the Arts Council England, and Jenny Lewin Turner, who is director of Urban Flow Creative. Welcome to you all and thank you very much for joining us. So what to expect over the next under an hour, <laughs> we will be introducing you to what bid writing is. We'll learn more about funding applications and how to tackle the funding form. We'll hear about working with communities and we'll also have a bit of a panel discussion slash Q&A and hopefully leave you with some practical tips for your next grant or bid application. Now, if you are interested in delivering an event or an activity as part of the World Reimagined, we are accepting applications for our micro and partnership grants. An application deadline is the 31st of May, so please do go ahead and visit our website on the What's Going On page to see how you can apply and what to expect from the application form. Lucky for you all it's a very light touch application so hopefully you'll gain something from this session today not only to help you to apply for our grant pots but to also apply for other funding that will be available so we do have questions and answers at the end but I would really love to hear um, from anybody who's joining us how much experience you have with grant or bid writing how confident you are how sex successful you might have been um, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat and answer and share any questions you have and we will endeavor to answer them all at the end so I would like to invite my first guest Helen Cooper hi Helen how are you Hi, Carolyn. And nice to be here. Good to see you all. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much for joining us. So could you give us a little bit of an overview of what your work as a senior manager for philanthropy slash visual arts entails? At arts yeah, so it's one. It's a classic two part role. Yeah. Um, and I look after our kind of national programs uh, involving visual arts. So I worked closely with the Arts Council Collection, who are based at South Bank Centre. Um, I work closely with some of the partnerships we have with national agencies such as National Trust with Canal and River Trust and Borough Street England. Um, I read some funding applications and, and comment on them. They're really exciting. It's a real joy as part of my role. And on the philanthropy side of things, again, it's kind of national strategic projects. So at the moment, we're finalising the private investment and culture survey, which, which um, benchmarks, you know, the levels of private investment that are being realised by the arts and cultural sector over the past few years, which is a really interesting one, having just come through the COVID pandemic. Hopefully we've come through it. We have to believe so. <laughs> we seem yeah. to continue to operate like that. Yeah. So have you been in this kind of um, philanthropy and funding space for how long have you been in this space? Oh, so I'm coming up to my four year anniversary in this role at Arts Council England. And prior to that, I worked at Tate. I was um, manager of their national partnership. So I worked across the Plus Tate network with the British Art Network and some other national projects. I'm actually a New Zealander. So I've been in the UK 16 years and I previously lived in Japan and Sydney, Australia. And I've always had an interest in the arts, I suppose. I studied English literature in New Zealand and I taught English as a foreign language in Japan, worked in a gallery in Sydney. And then when I came to London, I'm like, right, that's it. This is it. This is focus, focus and get into arts and culture. <laughs> we all have that moment where we're like, right, focus. <laughs> I wish we didn't. Uh, I like to have, explore and be curious about everything. And so from the funders perspective, what, what are funders looking for? So we have a strategy to 2030 called Let's Create. And Let's Create is really about enabling more creativity and culture across the country. 
I'm going to bring up my notes so I don't forget the key points, really. Um, so Arts Council England is a national development agency for creativity and culture. And in let's create. We want England to be a country in which the creativity of each of us is valued and given the chance to flourish and where every one of us has access to a remarkable range of high quality cultural experiences. So we invest public money from government and the National Lottery to help support the sector and everyone in it to deliver this vision. So it's really, really important that we see our funding distributed across lots of different places and to lots of different people. We want it to reach all parts of England and everyone in it. Amazing, amazing. And I have, I guess, I, I think I noticed that during the pandemic art, there was an increase in art production and an increase in content around art. How do you think that that's really changed? I know you were saying we're coming out of the pandemic. Do you think that there's been an uptake? I know that there was definitely at one point less art school applications for one project that I worked on, but do you think that that has changed now that we've come through the pandemic? I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because at an individual kind of creativity level and possibly for an arts and mental health and wellbeing aspect, there's been a lot of take up of individual practice mm -hmm. and maybe people who had a, a, a nascent, what's the word, burgeoning arts practice, something that they kept quite private might have just gone, I need this now to relax or to take my mind off the stresses of the world and, and to do that. And then I think there are ways that lots of people come together and the world reimagined is one of those projects where you're kind of bringing people and communities together in different places to, to reflect together on different things. Um, and I think art and the creativity and the production of art, the connecting around arts and culture is a really, it's a really um, critical aspect of enabling that, that process, isn't it? Of enabling people time to reflect and enabling um, a way of thinking about coming through something difficult like a pandemic or any situation so that's a really interesting question that I'm wholly unprepared for in terms of an <laughs> I like just throw it at you evidence <laughs> I, I like to throw a little wild huge. card in there every once in a while um but I only oh. asked because I personally that was my experience you were literally just talking about me as a, a freelancer as a consultant seeing everything kind of grind to a halt the mm -hmm. first thing I did was get my art supplies in I was like this is the only way I'm going to get through this and it was really amazing to have that opportunity because you know when else you get to stop completely and just be able to put your energy into something that you want to do but it really helped me in my sense and I kind of came out with a little bit more confidence in terms of what how I was going to adapt to this new environment so it's really mm -hmm. interesting to see you know maybe the pandemic in some way contributed and built the art space a little bit more because more people were creating and nobody knew I was an artist in that way which just reminded me that I just hid it too much because it wasn't connecting with like my core identity but so you're sharing your work more now Carolyn oh I love it more and I even got to commission um I got commissioned for a couple of pieces I had my first piece exhibited in a museum um unfortunately I'm back to not having the time to do it <laughs> But uh, I did have like a solid year of being able to paint and create art. And now mm. I have to, because if I can't get into it, I, I just, I'm like, okay, I'll wait until I have a, like a holiday or a brief period. But it was really helpful for my well being and my mental health. So I just wanted to kind of delve into that. So it'd be really good to know if there's common mistakes that you encounter when you read applications for. Yeah. I don't like to think of them as mistakes. So again, that's a, it's a really good question. So when I read when I read an application that really it really stings to me, you know, when I when I know like every single piece of the form, it's like there's no there's a lack of repetition, I think is something that's really good to see, even though perhaps any funding form can can um, kind of. Not fool you, but maybe maybe make you think that you need to be repetitive because it feels like it's asking for the same thing in a different way. But I think that's a really fundamental piece of editing that needs to come in towards the end of making the application process. And we have a Word document that's really useful tool to use if you're making a project grant application because you can use it to um, think about what your project is, how it meets the three outcomes in Let's Create, how it might contribute to the investment principles and inclusivity and relevance is a really fundamental one. And you can read it through, um, think about the risks of the project, obviously the budget, the income and the expenditure, and, and really get a sense of what's the totality of it. 
does this make sense? Could I hand it over to my best friend because <laughs> I have to go away for an emergency? And could they deliver this project and realize the um, the outputs, the outcome, and that impact? Like fundamentally, what's it seeking to change? So, and who is it working with? And how are communities going to um, feel different at the end of it? How, how are all the participants going to change through the process of that project? And I think it's really important to have it read through before any submission is made. And I think, you know, making the first forays into developing the project in the Word document um, is really helpful because it, it stops you thinking, oh, the form, it only lets me do this many characters. And, and actually you can test it out and play with it and see where where your character count can help you and where, where you might need a bit more work and get some reflection and feedback from critical friends along the way. Yeah, and I can understand that it might be a bit daunting to like share mm. your proposal with other people, but it's good to have that second or third eye. Um, so yeah, from mm -hmm. what I'm hearing, you know, try not to be repetitive because you think, mm -hmm. oh, that looks like you're consistent. <laughs> so I think that's a really good tip. And also, you know, proofreading and doing mm. kind of like a draft outside of actually applying because there's something that gives you gets you a bit anxious when you get on there and you have to like mm -hmm. and you just you have to press send. <laughs> so is there anything else that you would give as like a top tip for kind of making the chances of your application more successful? I think trying to to keep that anxiety down and not not do it too late so really take the time and think about our time scales for application because if you're applying for under thirty thousand pounds in project grants it does take eight weeks to reach a decision so you need to think about the forward planning and when you want to do your project and who you're doing it with and have have all your partners and people lined up first don't think that you can get them in play afterwards because that will um probably minimize chances it's it's really dependent on each project, each individual or each organization's application. But I think um, trying to really be clear about what the project is going to do and thinking about our three outcomes in, in that space and how it's going to do it and thinking about our four investment principles when you're thinking about that. And, and obviously it's kind of scalable. So the more you, money you're applying to us for, the more, impact against those outcomes and the more we want to see the embedding and the utilization of the investment principles through the practice and the process of, of um, making the project or the work or whatever it might be. Amazing. I think all of those are really relevant for the grant application. I'm just going to throw that in there. Um, I definitely think understanding and being very clear about your outcomes is mm -hmm. one of the key factors for uh, applying for grants at the World Reimagined. And also, yeah, getting your partners in line before you reply. <laughs> very very helpful you know having some meetings so you all know how you're going to work together how you're going to exactly. move forward so thank you for sharing all of those um we'll have a bit of q a at the end and bring you back in with some questions but thank you so much for sharing all of that Helen. all right so i'm going to bring in ruth welcome ruth hi ruth <laughs> Find the mute button. Hello, everyone. <laughs> we found the mute button. It's always playing with our emotions. Thank you for joining us, Ruth. So I think it's really important that you share how you came to work with the World Reimagined because you played a very pivotal role into how we are here today. So could you tell us a little bit more about that? <laughs> well, I was a, um, I'm someone who's started up um, a couple of charities um, and I've done that work in the past. I was a teacher for many years. And I was a teacher who used to work with a lot of black young people who used to be utterly furious at the lack of education around the issue of the transatlantic slave trade and the fact that their curriculum was so narrow um, and the fact that, you know, once a year they'd read um, To Kill a Mockingbird and they're expected to, to just, you know, that's you done, you're covered. So when I saw the world reimagined and I saw the opportunities it, it put forward, I just thought I need to throw myself into this. So I, I basically chased everyone down until they took me onto the board. <laughs> just stalked them and went after what you wanted. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, would you be kind enough to give us, I know that Helen's given us a really great breakdown of what's happening with the Arts Council, but maybe for anybody who has never even broached or applied for grants and bids, maybe you can give us like a very simple explanation of what that is. And, and then we can kind of delve into more of your experience in this area. 
Absolutely. Well, so hi, everyone. Hi, hi, people who are on. I've been looking at names. Um, just to say, first of all, um, I started off as um, someone who led a small grassroots community organisation. Um, and as you know, that means that you are the boss, you are the cleaner, you are the bid writer, you are the person who pitches, you're the person that the community shouts at when things go wrong. Um, and so I always used to find the process of bid writing quite stressful because it was always that I was trying to do this and juggle everything else at the same time. So I don't know if this applies to anyone who's on the call at the moment, but if, if at the moment you feel like you've got everything to do and the bid writing, hopefully when I go into a few kind of tips in terms of what might help, that there's ways of breaking it down a little bit. But it's, it's basically the process of applying for funds to support your work, to support your initiatives. We've also got some small pots available within the world reimagined. Um, and it's about you putting down on paper the vision that you've got right and trusting funders and philanthropists and others to come forth with the money that's going to enable you to um, fill and have the impact that you want to have yeah thank you so much for that and so what do you what have you witnessed as the biggest challenges to kind of accessing funding from a community standpoint even for yourself when you were first get, getting yeah funding? yeah good question i'm in a really interesting position in that i for years was on one side of the table in that i was asking for money and then once you've been a kind of northern black CEO for long enough, all those organisations ask you to sit on their boards deciding on the money. So it's really interesting now that I'm on the other side and I, you know, I sit on um, lots of different kind of trusts and foundations as an advisor. Um, and I see people coming forward who, who were basically me 20 years earlier. Um, so I've always, I always try to retain knowledge of what it felt like um, when these bids come in. Um, because, you know, I've definitely put in naive bids before. I've definitely put in bids where I've asked for the wrong amount of money or got, or got or not understood the difference between an outcome and a framework and this and that. And so I think sometimes it's about reminding those people who are making the decisions that, you know, the people on the other side um, are juggling a myriad of different challenging situations. Um, and we need to remember that. And they're not professional bid writers. Yeah, yeah, this is true. Um, and I think somebody in the comments was like, yes, totally agree, uh, you know, working around the clock. There's a, I think there's a famous meme that's like, you know, you quit your nine to five job so you can work 24 hours a day <laughs> and do every job under the sun. Um, and that tends to happen when you do your passion work. So in terms of the communities, I think one of the things in my research I found is that a lot of communities are put off by the kind of funding process and the bid writing and like, and also just feel like they will not be suitable enough or they might not be big enough. Is there anything you can kind of encouragement that you could give them to kind of think about how they could put themselves out there and the work they're doing and build on that? Absolutely. I think if I'm honest, if we were, if you'd asked me to, to have the same conversation 10 years ago, I'd be saying very different things. There's been a, a bit of a sea change. And I think funders now are looking at themselves and going, we need to do things differently. We need to, um, really witness and support a different type of expertise that comes from communities. I think that funders are also asking themselves difficult questions about who's around the table um, and who's deciding and you know where the power lies. And so I've seen for the first time over the past few years, groups coming forward with applications that might have been seen naive or not the finished article 10, 15 years ago, but actually now the grants officers are working alongside those groups and seeing where there might be challenges or seeing where there might be language issues and not just marking someone down because, you know, their, their language use isn't, you know, it's not RP English. It, like the, the definite change. And I feel there's, there's much more of a willingness of funders to meet you kind of halfway and to help you across the line. Um, not all funders, but some, the good funders are definitely saying, okay, let's meet you where you're at and learn a bit about you um, in your kind of, cultural you're, you're allowing you to be more culturally authentic um and seeing that as kind of your lived experience and that that's important mm -hmm. um so i think this is a really good time for community groups to be applying for money and for, to have confidence in to being authentic and being themselves that's really great to hear because um some of the research that i found um voice for change england did a survey that found 64 percent of bame groups wanted a better balance between project and core costs and longer term grants 
um, of the 64% of members surveyed, they want lo the longer term programs. You know, I think that the project by project is what's kind of they struggle with. And there's one from the big lottery uh, report on equal to the equation that suggested single identity bids meant groups from different um, equality strands were competing for the same pots of money. So that's another big one that comes up comp comp competition, right? You're competing for the same money. You wanted to make a comment? Yeah, just to come back on that, just to say, oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're going from a standing point. Um, so when you look at where we are now, it's not where we need to be at all. Um, um, but I'm saying it's better than it was. And I think there's also something that's, that's really important about the year on year funding. I think that as kind of cultural communities, we need to be we need to be a little bit sharper elbowed in what we're asking for I think sometimes we go into this I've definitely gone into it thinking well I'm not going to get this so I'm going to ask for what I think they'll give me mm. and, I've, and I've shrunk my impact down and I shrunk my organization down and I haven't gone in with the kind of confidence <laughs> you know a, a friend of mine said you need to go into the confidence insist of the confidence of a middle-class white man asking for money I was gonna and say oh, the same thing I was yeah, like, but it yeah. always stuck with me because how many people do that you know and mm. so now I've been turned down for more things recently. I've run a charity, I've been turned down for more things, but I'm like, okay, you don't want to support, you want to give me project funding of 3,000 pounds, we need 30. So either you're in, in with us or you're not. And if you're not, that's cool, well done. Mm -hmm. But I think there's something about us also recognizing that we're bringing something essential to the table. And either you can get a funder who's a good match, who wants to see you on that journey, or I think sometimes we have to just let some funders not be for us. And it's a really hard thing. But sometimes some funders, if you're going to have to write a 25 page application and you're up against 1200 people, is it, is that the best one for you? So I think it's sometimes about being discerning about where the, where the, the best fit might lie. And where do they find this best fit? Like how do you go about going and finding funders other than the big names that we kind of know of? how do you start approaching or finding the, the match that works for you? What I do is I, I look at organisations that I respect, that are doing work that I think is in the same kind of field, maybe not in my area, um, and quite often I will then contact the CEO there and ask them about their funding, you know, not trying to take it from them, just asking who they've had positive experiences with. And from that, I learned, I mean, I've never had a relationship with Lang Kelly Chase, for example, but I spoke to um, an organization that I absolutely loved and they were like oh Lang Kelly Chase are amazing at which point I was like okay so we started working with Lang, Lang Kelly Chase and they're really progressive in the way that they fund so now we're funded by Lang Kelly Chase and through that I've met other organizations who've introduced me to other more progressive funders mm -hmm. so I've left some of the more traditional funding behind um, but there's other avenues um, that you can go into but maybe just finding out who's being funded to do what that's a really good way if you can let if they can you can build a trusting relationship with them where they share who they're being funded with and they they share your values i don't see why not um and i think that's so important that kind of the, it's changing because um i found some more research that said that you know there was i think there was between nine and ten thousand BAME charities and community groups operating in the uk and 65 percent of them had less uh, an income less than ten thousand and then in March 2020, all the way back then, um, uh, the Ubele Initiative surveyed 165 BAME community organisations that found that nine in 10 could close over the next three months. Yeah. So chances are most of those community organisations have either completely gone or shrunk to the point that they have so little capacity that they can even engage in the opportunities that are out there. So I'm glad that there's different types of funding and I think it's great to diversify um, the type of funders that you approach. So I think we're going to leave it there because I would love to get Jenny in on this conversation, but we are going to come back to you where you can share some practical tips at the end. So thank you so much for that, Ruth. And can I bring on Jenny? Hi, Jenny. Hello there. Hi, how are you doing? How are you finding the conversation? <laughs> Yeah, really interesting from, from both. Um, really uh, interesting, brilliant advice, actually, that they've, they've given out there. Um, and uh, just from my perspective, as I, I am like a freelance creative producer, I work with different community groups. I spend a lot of my time supporting individuals and sort of small organisations just to go through the, the funding process. Um, and 
uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, what Ruth was saying, there, there is a sea change, but it, um, it, there is a sea change for sure. But it's there's still low take up at the moment of, of, of groups because um, there's a kind of lack of confidence because of the funding application can be so intimidating for some people. Um, it's it, it isn't an easy process for anybody. The big organisations have either full time fundraisers or somebody that they can employ to do their fundraising for them. And that's their sole focus when you're an individual or a small organisation, as everyone's saying before. It's, you know, it's one person doing absolutely everything. And I have been in the position where I've done from concept development, um, got the idea, get then get in, having to raise the money for the idea, then doing the delivery and then doing the evaluation at the end and then starting that big circle again. Um, and just, it's just, a, and as you were saying before, the project to project to project. And I think um, as a community, we need to get into the habit of being bolder what for, for for the ask being being a lot bolder and and yes asking for two and three year support the um the the, the kind of flash in the pan projects which which you know there's an endless ream of them but there's no there's no continuity there's no legacy from them and, and everybody is essentially starting from scratch each time you do an application because there isn't and you know there's just no sort of body that you can um reference so um I think it's really important and I also I would appeal to all of the, the the funding bodies to kind of have a plain English version of of the application not a matter of dumbing down it isn't that but the terminology some of the things that you you know not not everybody understands you know what an output is and what what um what an outcome what's the difference between that um you know they don't understand some of the phrases that are used um, and not everybody is used to actually articulating what it is that they do. And so you look at something and you can see a real gem of an idea, but it isn't, you know, straight away, it's going to be dismissed because it's not using the, the buzzwords or it's not using, you know, the right phrasing and, and, you know, the right terminology. So I think there does need to be, the, 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 that's part of the, the huge chasm that is out there between the people who need the money and the people who do get the money is that, that the funding application, the process itself, the language that's used, the terminology and, you know, the, the, the lack of support that is available. Um, so, yeah, my big appeal, as I said, would be for the for the funding bodies to kind of look into that and perhaps supply some um, additional support for, for groups who have never applied before, who may need who may need to have that. Um, be a really good resource um, or maybe some kind of like funding dictionary or something well, like that. Yeah, you know, it would be, it would be, I mean, I mean, we can do what is great today is, is fantastic, you know, just giving these little tips, but I think this should be a, a more central resource for um, that people can tap into, especially like I say, people who have not, ha you know, not been through the funding process before. Um, I mean, it's a difficult terrain anyway because you know you're applying it's hugely competitive lots of people bidding for the same money and usually the same priority groups as you say bidding for the same pot of money so it's already competitive and then if you are on the back foot because you don't know what certain things mean or what what should you focus on um uh, you know like I say there's some brilliant brilliant ideas out there but just people just don't know how do you translate your idea into what the funders want to hear yeah, how to define it realistically. And so maybe you could give us a quick clarification of what the difference between an output and outcome, common language that you think that mm, is done. Well, now you put me on the spot. Now I kind of, it's, it, it's um, I mean, there is, there is like the, the dictionary mm -hmm. definition, but in terms of when I'm doing an, uh, an application, uh, when I'm doing a funding application and you're asked to describe it, I, I go to... The aim, I think about the aims and objectives, first of all, and then the outputs and the outcomes that, you know, what it, what it is, what, what do you want to achieve by what you want to do? Um, <clears throat> and I, I do this because it helps me then frame the rest of the application. It, it's defining really clearly, <clears throat> you know, I want to, you know, do, uh, I, I, you know, I want to do, I'm trying to think, a, a, a series of workshops for a particular um, community group. <clears throat> And it's why do you want to use, why do you want to do those workshops? Have they do that community want them? Have they asked for them? Is there a need for it? Do you have you found a gap? 
you need to kind of, you know, um, clarify. And then output will be will be the, that that very thing, you know, a series of ten workshops um, for the group. That's your output. Um, or it could be a film, or it could be, I don't know, a piece of work, a piece of artwork, you're going to create it. The, an outcome is um, what has what has developed because you have done that project. If you do this workshop, um, the output, the outcome will be X amount of people will have an opportunity to engage with art. Um, people who couldn't draw before can now draw. People who had been in isolation before have now got a network of people. Those are those are, um, the kind of outcomes. It's like what what's the difference that you're going to make by by this project will be an outcome in short terms. Really, that's really helpful. Um, that's really helpful because one of the questions we have in the application is why is this important? Um, yeah. So again, this is where you can really think of your outcomes. Um, yeah from you know what what kind of influence do you want to have what kind of impact yeah. do you want to have um due to your initiative or your event or your engagement yeah and people don't often i mean they know it but don't often articulate it so that's why i say i really find it helpful to be really clear what my objectives are from from the from the offset i want to i want to do this because i know there's a need and then once you, you write once you've written all that out the other questions will make sense you can pick from your aims and objectives or, or or the you know the reason why you're doing it um will answer the will, will help you to answer the other the other questions um you know and also um in terms of describing the, the project um a handy tip to kind of think about you you've got you can have a very long version of of what it is like if you feel one side of a4 in terms of this is describing what what it is that you want to do and then you you might get us to condense that information down so it could be um you, you go from being one page to a paragraph you got how how do you condense that information into a paragraph um you know and then it's the how can you do that even further still condense it into a sentence you know the, the elevator pitch thing you meet somebody as you're going into the lift and you got they ask you what do you do and you before the lift reach, it reaches a destination you've got to have told them um what it is that you're doing so you need to kind of just find a way to i do this 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 really really quickly just condense it down and it, it'll take some practice to do but it's a really really useful ex exercise to do I recommend you I recommend you go networking if you want to like get that down but you have to keep people's attention spans and you have absolutely information out there yeah you do need to do it three times and 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 I think um excuse me what uh both Helen and, and Ruth were talking about before was so it's so crucial because the what I do I one, it, even though I'm so used to writing applications now, I let another set of eyes look at it definitely before um, submitting, and I do it twice over because I also I, I let somebody who's a who's nothing at all to do with the arts, unrelated to it, I let them read it and if and see if they can if it makes absolute sense, mm. and I use their questions on it to to then to to then you know. Um, um yeah, clarify, yeah, clarify anything that they've got questions and then i it's usually somebody in the arts world i get and they can they can pick me up on the technicality things or say oh no mention a bit more of this or you know bring that you, you know it's a difficult thing to go through on your own so i would let i always and then i look at it again with with, with fresh eyes but absolutely let somebody else see it before you submit because a tiny um, a, a, a tiny, it, I, I, again, I'm loathe to use the word mistake, but something that you've oh, you've overlooked, mm. um, it could be something that's really critical. Um, always pay clear attention as well to what the funders have, have asked you for, mm -hmm. and if you you might be able to talk really really well about lots of little things you do, but if you haven't answered their question, they're not going to be able to mark you to go to the next stage, mark you highly enough to go to the next stage because you haven't addressed. Um, it's like a job application, if you like, you know, have, are you, everything that they've specified that they, they want, have you covered it in your letter, in your application? Yeah, thank you so much for that. So, 
you work with organizations how do you get them how do you support them to tackle this you have like workshops or do you do one-to-one -one consultation and assessment um how do you go about it all of the above actually um lo lots of one-to-ones um because so many people have got they've got a range of, of, of issues but anything and in the common themes that, that come out then it's workshops that we can you know we can um have like small workshops and get people to um to go over they've asked for you know a, they've asked, everyone's asking the same question so then it's a workshop um that needs to um that needs to happen and the great thing about workshops is it's also another place where people can network, they can talk about their projects and, you know, and the, the so many different things c come out of those those meetings because, you know, you, you find, you know, someone, you know, you've got a filmmaker who is looking for artists to work with and, you know, actors or what have you. And um, it's, it's, you know, other things happen from from those networking sessions. But yeah, there's this. I work with quite a few individuals and and um, and like I say, small organisations. And also, I also fundraise for larger organisations, registered charities, and, and organisations who who have not got any coverage at all in terms of um, inclusive practice. So I've kind of stepped in. And but it has been the case that I've had to raise a fund for the activity that I want to want to see happen it's not it's not readily available mm. I still have to raise a fund and then be as an associate with the project so that's how I've kind of navigated the space amazing and in terms of inclusive practices that's obviously a buzzword that um, I'm sure everybody would be like what does that mean because I can imagine a lot of people are like well of course I want everyone to feel included or welcome at the event but how can they actually start thinking about what they could be doing to be more inclusive is there any tips you have for that for oh, well but you could never cover it in this meeting yeah. but <laughs> yeah, never cover it in this meeting and I, I think I think the issue especially um in Brighton where I am that there's all, always been a lot of talk of it it's always about you know everyone's you know it is a very um vibrant welcoming city but inclusive no the, there are there are still huge gaps in in provision um so uh there's there's a lot of funding that is pumped into the city very little of it makes it to the the, the real communities in in need sadly um and you know it, it it will be there's lots of different communities who who don't just get the don't get anywhere near the funding or if they do they have to kind of almost go with a begging bowl to the people who do have it and then be on their terms it's not equitable it, there's no sort of real equal partnerships at the moment in terms of um in terms of that um <laughs> yeah in terms of in terms of that happening so um but inclusive practice yeah it just means that more people as people who not the usual suspects get to engage with the arts whether it be going to, to the cinema going to you know creating work or doing what they do but it just means that more people um like i say rather than the, the people who can afford to do it anyway can do it and also just thinking about you know how you present to these audiences thinking about if it is your your presentations inclusive maybe even like having interpreters and things like that so thinking about how everybody can feel welcome and included and not just a, an add-on is so important and I think it's a fundamental part of the world reimagines you know ethos especially going forward ex with all the inspire events we really want them everyone to feel that they are welcome well thank you so much for that Jenny I think what I want to do is I want to move on to some just generalized questions so I'm going to throw them at all of you and because we talk about the why quite a bit, um, I thought maybe you could share what inspired all of you to get into the work that you do, because you all work in spaces of influence and change making. So who would like to share their why first? <laughs> I'm now I'm putting you all on the spot, so that's fine. <laughs> I could oh, my oh. why if it would help everybody. <laughs> Go for it. Um, my wife working with the world reimagined was really, um, I love intervention spaces and I love that art was the tool that they were using to intervene, but also the aspect of helping communities build relationships with each other. Um, I had learned that, you know, it's a very competitive space. A lot of the time you, you don't get to work with people even in your own community. You might, you might be lucky if you work with other people across the UK. So I loved aspect of community building um, with this project and I love that art is the tool of intervention so that's my why go ahead Jenny 
Well, uh, my I've I've always been really interested in the arts, and for me, it has saved me from a completely different um, lifestyle. And um, it, it's just been all the way through since I don't know since childhood. Always been interested in not some even so much as a practitioner, just being in the, the space where people are being creative. It's always been that's always worked for me. Um, in terms of my well-being and 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 how I've felt, but I've also all, always wanted to give back support. So I see my role as an enabler, enabling artists to do what they do best, and in enabling communities to engage with those artists and to get, you know, access to better opportunities in life to help them and support them. And like everything that you you said, yeah, totally. Um, uh, you know, to, to totally. Um, agree with everything that you've just said there because it's a real it's a real passion but for me I, understanding how fundamental art is to everybody's life and you may not think of it as art you might you know um you, you speak to a lot of people you know are you in the arts and, and, and you ask them what they're doing in the pastime oh I sing or I write a bit of poetry or I like you know that's arts but again it's they don't um they don't uh, see it as they don't see it as as art so I get that's going back to something I was saying before in terms of the terminology and phrasing recognizing that people identify and use different names for this for the exactly the same thing so um but yeah I'm just really passionate about trying to support you know provide in, enabling facilitating people to engage with the arts those who don't normally that's amazing thank you very much who would like to share next Ruth. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Um, uh, oh, in terms of describing the work that I do, I think I'm I'm very much about kind of galvanising both myself and other people, and I'm very interested in systems and power and how to shift <laughs> some of these systems and power and also how to, to approach that with confidence. And so I think a lot of what I do is about peering into where power is and then going across and whispering to where power is not about how to get some of that and to use it. Um, like even when Jenny was talking then, I was just, I was listening to what Jenny was saying about resources and thinking, right, we need to we, we need to talk and work out how we can get those resources redistributed. So yeah, that's, that's me, disrupting systems. Oh, I like that. That's a good one. Helen, <laughs> you feel you're like, this. I'm lost. <laughs> um, but I think, I think there's, an inherent curiosity in me so I'm, I'm curious about the systems I'm curious about how people feel when they encounter and participate in art and culture and and that's of every single kind so I think yeah just really understanding how to connect all the things and how to enable organizations to to showcase a range of different work mm -hmm. from a range of different people for and with a range of different people I think is really really exciting but also giving that individual and and we're back to what we were talking about your practice during the pandemic Carolyn about how people can just find themselves and others through creative participation I think that's what's really exciting and it's for everyone and every culture every background has has a long tradition of making and doing and marking and yeah, it's, it's there within all of us. So I think if we can bring it out and maximize it. That's what, what kind of gets me. That's really beautiful. And you make a good point because I think I, when I realized that most people didn't know I was an artist, I realized that I'd hidden a part of my identity because it wasn't like the dominant part. And then I thought, oh my God, I've just been like, you know, subduing my creative side. And then I came to the realization that actually, because I'm a facilitator, because I design programs, I was using creativity. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't practicing art in the traditional way. So I was like, actually, I am a creative in that way. So I think anybody on here who might be like, I'm not an artist, um, we all use creative thinking. And I think mm -hmm. it's even about how we approach um, problem solving, decision making, everything like that. So thank you for sh sharing that. So I wanted to, this is another open question. How do we work towards a spirit of collaboration instead of competition? Who would like to take that? Ruth? I think just for, to, to start seeing that collaboration is where the power lies. It, it really is, you know, like whether, you know, I, I run grassroots community groups and, and at the end of the day, until people recognize that we can do incredible multi-year work, 
rather than me always partnering with a big cultural organization that's going to use us tokenistically and we're going to be the tick 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 refugee asylum seekers working class kids for them why instead would i not partner with another seven grassroots organizations and we go for the big pot and then amongst ourselves we decide how that money is going to be split and who needs what that there's different ways of splitting the pie mm. and too often we we allow ourselves to be the, the junior partner and I, I just feel that there's real power because that's what that's what funders want to see that they're maximizing their money so let's look at who else is doing similar work and don't see them as competition but also enhancing what you've got and then also cut down your back office because if you've got seven or eight organizations who are working you know with shared values or themes well maybe you don't all need a bid writer and you don't all need someone and you've got one volunteer manager who works over the different programs so you can actually strip down kind of how much admin you're doing but go for multi-year powerful money so that's what I would say definitely yeah. and it really gives you that sense of ownership um and, and power and, and power and powerfulness yeah yeah, yeah. It's amazing Anybody else like to respond to how we can be more collaborative instead of competitive? I think what Ruth says is really important. I think by joining forces, it you know, there's that strength in the connection. And and I think you can maximize all the resources by doing that. Um, I completely understand why the, and when the competition comes about, but if it can be if it can be worked through and and those common aspects can be found I think those are the points those nodes where the the um by working together you become much stronger and then there's that that legacy aspect there's the the pulling through of all the work that everyone gets behind that I think is is you know it's more efficient and it can be more exciting and yes it takes longer mm. absolutely takes longer to establish these partnerships but in the long run they're absolutely worth it I, I would say as well that the um, I, I absolutely can totally agree with everything that's been said, but the partnerships, the collaborations also need the support as well, because, you know, it's you entering new relationships. And I think, um, you know, just to just to kind of navigate this, this new relationship, what's happened in the past, and I really hope it doesn't happen anymore, would be there would be a, a really strong organisation would 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 put in a bid and they'd be told, yeah, it was great, but we want you to partner with another company, an existing company who we know and we like and we we trust. So you've got to have to you either work with them or you're not getting the money. And then, you know, as I, as I said before, there was unequal partnerships and all sorts of, 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 of terrible things happen. And I'm, I'm hoping that's no longer the case that, you know, things will be seen. But it, as with anything new or, or developing ways of practicing it, it will need some support to you know to you know someone just to kind of mediate it at the beginning and make sure that it's everything is equitable and everyone is is really clear on what they're doing there's that there's an understanding in place and working forward but absolutely collaboration is is the way to do I always collaborate um, everything I do is, is, has been a collaboration. I've never, you know, I've always said there's no such thing as a, a one man band. It just doesn't happen. I, I do lots of different things, but I always really, I rely on a really um, trusted body of people who can, who can um, support these, all these various initiatives. I could not possibly do it on my own and just think, you know, the, the current things I'm working with, I'm working on, I'm, I'm collaborating actually with big organizations, but it's to deliver a community program in a way that's never been done before with some joined up thinking and still project based like you know a, an annual project based but looking towards how can we make this like ongoing and link link up things that are already happening in the in the um in the cultural calendar there's a range of things that happen throughout the year anyway but looking at ways that the wider community can actually be part of it rather than it being just the, the you know reserved for you know the, the usual suspects yeah the same types of organizations who, yeah. yeah yeah but just getting them to think differently so collaborate collaborating on different levels collaborating with with, with like-minded souls mm. you know collaborating with organizations and, and pushing back as i say on this when when now you know there there is a, there is um a, a, an under, a different understanding a different way of thinking but still pushing back on when you are the, you're being forced to have a relationship that you don't think is going to be particularly useful for you we you know we have got a strong power base we just don't recognize it um and we need to 
you know the way to do it is to do what everyone has already been talking about it's already been working <laughs> and also you know when you are under capacitated like you know it just feels like a lot and you're doing it all on your own so thank you for all of that we haven't got long but I have one question to all of you before I take it over to Ruth for some top tips and maybe if you could answer it as short as possible how can we deal with rejection mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> not to see it as rejection to see it as an opportunity because every single time I've applied and not got through I've learned something from the process and and you take that with you and it turns out I got rejected for a particular bid um and all the learning I did from the feedback from it and going through the process of it another more exciting better more suited bid came up I applied and got that instead so still go through the process absolutely and don't see it as rejection it's it's an opportunity it's a learning opportunity amazing helen exactly that so get the feedback um and and it might not be you it might just be competition for funds and i know that's an awful phrase that nobody ever wants to hear but it is highly competitive so there might be nothing wrong with your bid and then there might be ways that could be strengthened so um if it was an application to us and it's been unsuccessful come back to us for some feedback have an advice giving session um we're a bit constrained at the moment from what we can do but hopefully later in the year we'll be able to give more and um, more frequent advice giving and there's lots and lots and lots of information on our website maybe too much um there's an easy read form <laughs> and our customer services team are always contactable so you can get in touch and find out more but yeah see it as an opportunity we will definitely be making links to those resources in the toolkit. Um, and then I'm going to take it over to Ruth so you can share your tip on how to deal with rejection, maybe continue with some top tips for practical uh, to, to use practically for your applications. That would be great. I will. I'm just laughing. I was laughing. I was laughing before when Jenny was talking because you were so eloquent and wise. And I was like, when I grow up, I want to be Jenny because that's not how I deal with rejection. I cry. I kick things. I feel furious. I curse everyone. And then I, the next day I kind of take a deep breath and, and go back into it. So I'm such a child with it completely. Um, vent. Get it out of your system. Yeah, I vent. I vent and I rage. Um, but then, you know, then I realise it's all it's all fine. Um, so yeah, I've just written some tips, but um, and I think Caroline's got um, an email that's going to go out afterwards that's, that's going to have these. I'll just quickly go through because we've only got a couple of minutes. Um, but I wrote the tips down, so I might as well just share them. Some of them may be useful, some of them maybe not. Um, but one of the things that I've come across is the same person quite often writes the bids in the organisation and sometimes that's the wrong person. Mm. Have the person who feels most passionately about the work writing the bid. And if their literacy skills are not great, record them or interview them. Have the passion of the person or, or the person leading the work coming through. So quite often when I work with young people, quite often it used to be the adults writing the bids and now we're like, no, it's the young people. This is youth-led work. Let them write it. Be upfront and say, look, this is a 15-year-old wrote this paragraph and a 19-year-old wrote this paragraph and a young person wrote this paragraph whose English is a second language. Be upfront about who's writing what, but let the people actually write the bids themselves rather than it always being that same kind of very neutral voice. Straight away when I'm reading them around across the table, I'm like, interesting. This is interesting. This is real work. So that's one thing. Um, next one I've got is be authentic. Buzzword, yes, but own your strengths and challenges. I used to paint a really beautiful picture of I'm a great CEO, we've got a great organisation, we're going to change the world, impact, blah, blah, blah. Now I like warts and all, I am a tired CEO, we're under-resourced, this is the problems. We ran this last year and this didn't go well, but we've learned from it and this is what we're going to do this time instead. Don't hide your challenges, otherwise well, where's the growth and development? So there's something about being very, very honest about your organisation. You know, if you haven't got resource enough and if you are someone who's doing seven things, put that in the bid because then they need to understand around the table when they're evaluating. This organisation needs our funds. It needs our money. Um, I've mentioned this next one, but consider the values of the funder. Are they a good fit? So I had a funder call me the other day and she basically, you know, she's got money, right? And I need money, but she's basically politically not on the same page some of the language used about my community was a little bit problematic to be honest but she's got money I need and then I had to go and have a really deep conversation with myself and just go do you know what I do need the money but I don't need her money and so there is something about kind of just making sure because otherwise down the line that's going to be problematic she's either going to turn up at one of your events or 
because her expectations of the work and my expectations of the work are going to be different. We're not meeting values wise. So choose the right funder. And I'll just do, I'll, I'll do maybe one more, Carolyn, and I'll stop. Um, I've put, we're just ordinary people. So we're funders, you know, Helen's there. Seems a perfectly lovely, ordinary person. I'm ordinary, Jenny's ordinary. Like build relationships. It's about relationships. I remember my funder said that the child had a birthday and sent her a text about it. And, you know, like, and when we got over the line and, she, and we got that money finally from lottery, she was in nearly in tears because she'd battled with me for months and months and months to shape that bid and shape that bid. And when she told me, like, literally, we, it was Zoom, but we nearly hooked. Build the relationship is what I would say, because then you've got people who are not just looking at a, a, a 2D piece, but they're looking at a 3D piece of work and they care about you and they will fight for you in those rooms. So, yeah, build the relationship. That's an amazing. I'll leave it there. There's more about it. Leave it. Yes, we will have more tips available. We will share it in the follow up and in the toolkit that you will have access to. Our time is up, but thank you so much, Jenny, Helen, Ruth. You all shared some amazing insight and I hope it was valuable to everyone. Thank you for everyone who um, engaged in the chat. Um, Chantel asked for feedback, was on it already. Um, thank you for having us for the third session. Um, this was brought to you by uh, Esme Fairburn Foundation, who has supported the community program, the Inspire community program, and our presenting partner, Sky. If you missed any part of this session, it was recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel and in the toolkit. Um, please join us on the 31st. We have breakthrough conversations with um, founders from The Other Box, Opal 22 and Red Earth Collective. And please don't forget to put your grants and applications in. You've just got some lovely tips from everybody. So please do go ahead and apply through our website and all the questions are on the website so you can prep ahead of time before you even press the submit button. Thank you again. Everybody enjoy your afternoon. See you in the next one. Bye. Bye. Bye now.